So we thank all the professors who brought their students here. We thank all the students and the community folks who came out today. Uh, we're always glad to have you here and involved in the process. Uh, we're going to um, move forward on this, but we first need to do a couple of things uh, that are obviously important for us to do. The first of which is that uh, before we actually formally begin, I want to ask permission of the elders to begin. Thank you. Uh, you're not an elder. What are you talking about? Granted. Let's try that again. Ask permission of the elders to begin. Thank you. Uh, and so that uh, in our tradition, it's important to recognize that, that speaking is a privilege uh, in the presence of our elders, and so that we must ask them, regardless of how many degrees you have or how many accolades you may have, uh, that you ask permission of the elders to begin speaking because it is, is, is in their, their midst. They've walked here before and they've covered so much ground that we're thankful to be able to follow in the footsteps that they left for us. So uh, now I'm going to uh, pour libations, and libations is a tribute to those who came before us, and we do so uh, in honor and in recognition of their, uh, of, their, of, their, of their contributions and their sacrifices. And so uh, I'll do that now. And as I pour libations, uh, here I pour libations, I pour water into a plant. Uh, I ask you to say ashe afterwards. It means uh, so be it. It's a uh, recognition, uh, appreciation that we have of their contributions. And um, some places they pour alcohol, some places they pour water, we pour water. So, uh, so that we, we recognize that the contributions that we make here today are in memory of those that came before us, that there's thousands and thousands of folks that played the foundation for us to be able to be in these educational institutions, to be able to, uh, to walk this earth. And so for their sacrifices and their contributions, we say, Ashe. Uh, for the contributions today in particular, we pay homage to uh, those who struggled to help us to understand about Pan-Africanism. Uh, early folks like um, uh, Marcus Garvey was one of the early ones, Ashe. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the early ones, Ashe. Henry Sylvester Williams was one of the early ones, Ashe. Uh, and so many others uh, who contributed to what became a, a movement about Pan-Africanism, this idea of collective African people moving together under collective identity to transform the world in which they knew uh, that was oppressive at the time that they developed these ideas back in the early or the late 1800s. Uh, for all those women in Pan-Africanist movement, we say Ashe. Um, and that was Amy uh, Garvey and, and other folks that, that, that contributed to those ideas who worked in the ways to bring about change, uh, not just for people of African descent, but for the world, but also for uh, looking at uh, women involved in the struggle. Uh, we want to pour libations for uh, all those uh, other folks on the continent who made contributions to, um, uh, to Pan-Africanism, such as uh, Nkrumah, Ashe, Azikiwe, Ashe, uh, Kenyatta, Ashe, uh, all the brothers and sisters in the Pan-Africanist movement in South Africa, Ashe. And for those of us here, lots of people in the United States who struggled to bring about and talk about and transform uh, the world, and they work towards a Pan-Africanist idea in the United States, we say Ashe. And then we ask you to call the names of any of your ancestors who you may uh, want to think they didn't have to be Pan-Africanist, but who you want to be with us today. Call their names, please. Ashe. 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 All right. Otis Darrell. Ashe. So all these people are people whose names we call because we know that they made substantial contributions to what we do and how we do what we do. And so for those whose names have gone unspoken, but we know that they know we are here today, we say Ashe. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of people who I want to thank also who helped to make things happen uh, in the Africana Institute. And without their assistance, we wouldn't be able to do much of what we do. So I want to thank, uh, she's trying to walk and hide, run away real quick, but I'm not going to let her do that. Her name is Kim Renee McGregor, uh, Gregory. Let, let, wave, let, wave to her in the back. She's trying to run out the back door. <laughs> and then we also have, uh, I don't know if he's in the room right now, but Jaja Shakur. Is Jaja in the house? He's not in the house, but Jaja has uh, been out around helping to make things happen, so we appreciate all the assistance they bring to the table. So now we move on to uh, the reason why we're here today. We're here to hear a, uh, a talk by none other than uh, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries. Uh, Dr. Jeffries was born and raised in Harlem, New York, 
Her parents were uh, from South Carolina. Her educational degrees were from Hunter College, her, where she got her bachelor's and her master's, and she also got a master's and a PhD in 1991 in uh, history of art from Yale University with a specialization in African and African-American culture and history and museum studies. Her first trip to Africa was in 1960s. So for those of y'all who've never been, you know that you need to make sure that, uh, that, you, that you learn to represent uh, and that you have to be inspired by someone who's been there a long time ago and, ha and knows at least a little bit. You know, those of you who think you know something because you've been someplace once, uh, someone who started there in 1960. <laughs> uh, she was with uh, Operation Crossroads Africa with Dr. James Robinson, Presbyterian minister, which was the forerunner of the Peace Corps. In 1965 through 66, she lived in uh, Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire under the academic fellowship with her husband, and, as Dr. Leonard Jeffries, then a, Dr. Leonard Kwaku Jeffries, and her husband at that time, and uh, participated in the first festival of African art uh, in Dakar, Senegal. For four years, she was employed by the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where she curated an exhibition on ceremonies and spirit uh, through the uh, community education department, uh, where she was, uh, let's see, what is it? Where, where permanent uh, uh, prison art, uh, well, through a permanent prison art program, and also uh, artifacts to heal the mind, the body, and the spirit, sociologically inspired uh, for young, unmarried, pregnant girls who needed, uh, who were on their horizon uh, for upliftment. Uh, Dr. Jeffries is someone who, when you look uh, around and you want to see a woman who is someone that's dedicated to the community, someone who uh, works hard and tirelessly to transform the minds of uh, younger and older folks, uh, when you want to find someone who inspires you uh, based on her ability to pull from uh, her ancient wisdom up to the present time, uh, then I suggest that you open your ears, your mind, your body, and your spirit for what you're about to hear. Uh, when you want to be uplifted uh, spiritually, you'll hear someone who has the, the understanding of, of things spiritually that you may not have been able to tap into in your past experiences. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries is someone who uh, is, is married to a man who is a giant in, him, um, in and of himself, and she is a giant in and of herself. And so when you have two giants uh, sitting at the, at the table, uh, of, and you now sit at their feet, and you listen, so you open your mind, your eyes, and listen. I always say that we need to sit at the feet of the elders so that we then can have the possibility of transforming our space so that we can rest assured that tomorrow will not be the same as today. And with that said, I give you Dr. Rosalind Jeffers. Let's give her a round of applause, please. Greetings, scholars, students, those of you who love research, those of you who are on your way to a powerful success, and those of you who are already successful. Uh, I am thankful for Dr. Califani um, and the work that he has been doing. We know him beyond the wonderful things at Essex County College. And um, we have known him through WADU, the World Diaspora African Union, and we have known his work through working with the African American OAU, with um, uh, the United Nations. We very often see him at international events and rub shoulders and continue to do that at various national conferences. And we're always delighted because he did host the Association for the Study of African Classical Civilizations right in these august uh, space right here, this hall. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the women that surrounded giants, and these women indeed were giants themselves. I will be talking about Amy Ashwood Garvey, um, who was at the first Pan-Africanist Congress uh, that met in 1945 and I'll be talking about her life and how she managed to build up Marcus Garvey. And I'll also be talking about the second wife of Marcus Garvey, uh, Amy Jacks Garvey, 
and the roles that, that she did in continuing to build him up. And at a time when he was in prison, she continued his work and continued his legacy. And so in, I'll also talk about a little bit about Shirley Du Bois, the woman who helped to, um, to, to support W.E.B. Du Bois and the role that she played. We need to study these women who supported men in marriages because we young people need to understand what marriage is really about and how to deal with longevity. And if you cannot deal with longevity like Amy Ashwood, they were only married for three months. She played a significant role continually in his life. But some of you who have gotten divorced, what does that mean? And what does that mean as you continue to live and move as a woman? And then in light of those things, we need an understanding about the single woman, the role in the struggle, the role in economics and cooperative units. And so I'll be talking about cooperative units because so much has been said about all oh, those blacks can't get together, they can do nothing, they're always arguing, somebody runs away with the money, and blah, blah, blah. That is not true. If you deal with this facts as a scholar, you will find out about the hundreds of associations, and I would like to be mentioning some of them where black people were able to get together. Even our Harriet Tubman dealt with land, purchase of land, purchase of a house, and uh, economic development. She was a woman that went into the laundry business. And those things we do not know because we don't go further enough. That's why Dr. Jeffries, Leonard Jeffries, is always talking about, well, you should study so-and-so, you should study so-and-so, because studying them within this broader context of the big family and the bigger family and the national and the international is so very important to us. And so as I was entering, one of the young men that I'm looking at right now said, uh-oh, here comes the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so I will say to you in beginning, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, all of thy soul, thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself, as thyself, as thyself, as thyself. What does that mean? It gi God gives you permission, if you're walking right, to love yourself. And there's a lower self, and there's a higher self that's the God that lives within you. And Marcus Garvey was a man that also understood the power of the Almighty. And that's why he organized the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And that is why he was built up, and that first wife came to him singing hymns. I, I looked at the hymns in the archives that she sung and actually recorded the words about great glory and God Almighty. And I also recorded the Bible verses that uh, Marcus Garvey himself used. And these things were so important because he said, up you mighty race, and things about black power in the midst of the Ku Klux Klan, he said these things. He said these things in the midst of um, the uh, many waves as you could count the thousands upon thousands in the, each state of the United States of America. I have the list of the thousands that reigned and ruled. And you understood, I'm sure, when you saw the Ku Klux Klan marching in Washington, D.C. And so this is the climate. And it was also the climate when the great interlocking companies, uh, the barons and the rebels, were establishing themselves in Europe in exploitations and also in America in illegal bondage 
and legal, illegal. And, and so he rose during that time. And so what does it mean to come against as a warrior scholar a warrior activist to come up against the society in which you live? Those are the things that we want to talk about. And in the midst of that, I also want to talk about some of the women that stood around Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee, the women behind the scenes who helped to build Tuskegee. I'll uh, call their names for you. But we recall, too, that in uh, Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington made a profound statement that makes us and continue to make us and keep us as the mothers of humanity, the mothers of love, because that's what Martin Luther King did. That's why they acknowledge him around the world, not just in America. In Israel, you have in the Black Forest an area named after him. In uh, India, you have uh, places named after him, plazas. In Hungary, in many places, uh, as well as the Martin Luther King Drive that's right outside of the college here. And so that why are they acknowledging? Because they understood the power and the force of the superiority of the love that God so loved us first. And as, with that love, we learn to love humanity and to stand against the forces of nature. So that when it says to turn the other cheek, it was not uh, turn the other cheek to be beat up again. But if you have an inner man, inner woman, if you have inner eyes, the two eyes become one, the uchat in ancient Kemet. If you have ears that open to hearing the right message of your people and your ancestry, the righteous of the ancestry, not the ancestry that didn't do right, then indeed you have another cheek, another eye, ear, another cheek. And so it was to turn that cheek, which was the God cheek, and who dares strike the cheek of God? Your arms are too short to box with God, so how are you going to box and hit and strike? But we still needed the other points of view that like Malcolm X had said, no, 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 I'll put those things together, fingers together, and I will punch you out, don't even think about it. So we uh, grab a hold of all of those points of view. But Booker T. Washington said in Up From Slavery, I learned the lesson that great men cultivate love and that only little men cherish a spirit of hatred. I learned that assistance given to the weak makes the one who gives it strong, and that oppression of the unfortunate makes one weak. And so he said that he learned these lessons, and he resolved that, he said, I would permit no man, no matter what his color might be, to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate him. With God's help, I believe that I have completely rid myself of any ill feelings toward the southern white man for any wrong that he may have inflicted upon my race. I am made to feel just as happy now when I am rendering service to southern white men as when the service is rendered to a member of my own race. I pity from the bottom of my heart any individual who is so unfortunate as to get into the habit of holding race prejudice. And so he said these things, too, also in the midst of the wiling and the wiles of the um, Ku Klux Klan. Um, <clears throat> we are an African people, the primogenitors of the human race. Out of us came the other races. That's not something that's debatable anymore because we know the various sciences have already proved it. The anthropologists, the Leakey family, finding the first earliest you know, uh, bones, et cetera, of, uh, of Denkinesh, Lucy. We know this uh, from the archaeologists like um, uh, Donald, Dr. Donald Johansson. When I heard him, I was on the same billing 
uh, I think it was, uh, no, Lauren Katz, uh, but also that billing was at the Mu American Museum of Natural History. And I spoke at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, we also heard that from uh, uh, linguists and geneticists, the genetic works of Dr. Spencer Wells. We know it from the melanin studies of Dr. Check onto Diop. And um, uh, we know it from the art and archaeology that I was doing the research and work uh, in reference to those things. So it's no longer debatable. But at the time of Marcus Garvey, it was because people didn't know and they didn't quite believe in the things that were said by Du Bois. But in his spirit, Marcus Garvey did uh, say that there was a black Christ right, at a time when it was not popular. In the 1920s, John Henry Clark wrote the book about the black Christ. And so our people understood the power of who we are in history and the power that came from ancient Kemet, the early great civilizations of the world and the contributions. I don't want to uh, uh, stop there, but I do want to tell you about Dr. Wade Noble who said that um, uh, 50 to 70,000 years ago, Africans walked out of Africa to the Middle East and became Persians, became Arabs. 40,000 to 50,000 years ago, Africans walked out of Africa to Australia and became Aborigines. 40,000 years ago, Africans walked out of Africa to Asia to become Asians. 12, 15 to 12,000 years ago, Africans walked out of Africa to North America and became Native Americans. 12 to 15,000 years ago, Africans walked out of Africa to South Africa and became Hispanics. And so that's the foundation why we must win and we must continue on to hold up truth no matter how painful it may be. But at the same time, we must use discernment in order to know when to speak and when not to. And so we're glad for men who were giants like Marcus Garvey and the women who kept him standing and in good order uh, because that message continued so that we could today can begin to study the details of his life. Now, as I mentioned about um, uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, she too is more than what meets the eye that when we reduce her to just a few things on Black History Month in elementary schools and in public schools, but we have to realize that she put her life on the line. She was a spy in the Union Army in the Civil War she was a leader of troops, right? So uh, uh, that we all, blacks had militias. Remember after Reconstruction, uh, Tunis Campbell had black militia. So we tried to fight up and put resistance, 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 uh, said Fred, Frederick Douglass. And so she led the troops in a, uh, and also the recruiting with Frederick Douglass. Um, she got 756 blacks to fight in the army. And uh, the US government gave them no money. John Brown called her a man and called her general troops, but most people call her Moses, which was the same thing as Marcus Garvey. Uh, Amy, uh, Garvey, uh, uh, Amy um, Ashwood was the one to end up saying and talking about the birth of Marcus Garvey. When he was born, his um, his father raised him up and called him Messiah, meaning after Moses to lead your people, but to us Messiah means, you know, it means God, uh, that kind of a force. And so that, that was a force we can say was in it. She was also a nurse in the army and knew uh, medicine and herbs and uh, some scholars think that she has a background uh, uh, from Ghana that uh, why she was able, her father was able to teach her about the stars and 
uh, the planets, etc., and to locate the Dipper so that she could indeed move out. Um, thank you, thank you. Glad to see you. Glad to, to uh, see you here. Uh, on, on your territory, your grounds, uh, Dr. Robert Spellman is an um, old friend. And uh, I, I open with the Holy Ghost, Dr. Spellman. <laughs> Okay, so she was a naturalist, and so when they had the words hush puppy, you know, to put the crumbs down for the dogs so that they would not be as likely to attack them because the dogs knew them from the works and, uh, you know, the, the, the plantation. Uh, so that word hush puppy for bread crumbs, uh, those expressions we think in terms of the naturalist that she was, that knew all of those details. And of course, the major on the Underground Railroad, I want to move ahead because you can easily find all of these things for yourself. She carried the Bible in one hand and also a gun in the other. Uh, but there is a description about her from the Quakers, a man whose name is Garrett, Thomas Garrett. And in it, he describes how the Holy Ghost in Harriet Tubman would tell her to go to a particular safe house. And uh, she would begin to cross a river and a stream that she was told to cross. And the men thought that this was not possible. But when they saw her out there, they continued to follow her uh, uh, behind. And so the actual words uh, that uh, she, that was used in reference to her, we do have historical accounts of those words. And, um, the, let me see if I had right here in front of me some of those precise words. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, it, uh, it was told, she said that God told her to stop, which she did. And then she asked God, what she must do. He told her to leave the road and turn to the left. She obeyed and soon came to a small stream of tide water. There was no boat, no bridge. She again inquired of her guide what she should do. She was told to go through. It was cold in the month of March. But having confidence in her guide, she went in. Water came up to her armpits. The men refused to follow until they saw her safe on the other shore. And there are accounts like that of Harriet Tubman that told her not to go to a particular safe house that she was go supposed to go to. And so she bypassed it and went on and said, the spirit told her to go to another house she did. And that was safe and she learned that a whole posse had come to the first place looking uh, for her. Uh, there's much more details, but I want to, since I'm talking about the economics of uh, people, I want you to know about the house that she bought. So, of course, she took the uh, large number of people, hundreds of people, uh, out of the enslavement and took them north. But, um, but she came to the possession of houses in the state of New York. And the property consisted of uh, 26 acres of land on which two splendid houses stood at the time. The property was worth $6,000 in her day uh, during slavery, but was burdened with a mortgage of $1,700. It was her daily prayer that this might be removed so that she could bequeath the house free from debt to her race to be used as an old folks home and a place to rehabilitate uh, young people. In 1906, she decreed this property to the AME church and um, in the hopes that the church would uh, continue those uh, kinds of uh, national non-sectarian groups and expand the property into the home that she wanted for the ages. And you can always go up to Auburn, New York, and visit uh, these things. And then later on, as I mentioned, she took on the business of uh, laundrying, would go about as she owned her property, et cetera, et cetera. But these were thrifty women 
And the women, in order to make organizations run, had to go and do these various things. If you ask some of the people who were in their 80s and 90s about the era when blacks used to go door to door collecting laundry, go back starch and boil them in pots with lye soap or whatever, and uh, they created all kinds of business. And even the Brana business, the, the hair multi-million, you go into any of the uh, super drug stores, you can buy hair products from the Branas. But it was begun by women. And that was part of the fam family of Leonard Jeffries, you know? And that was the side that he needs to go and contact even more because they're millionaires and, you know, we need the funds. And so, um, but in order to uh, sell the newspapers, the young men in the family sold the newspapers. So these menial jobs grew into big things, like we know on Delancey Street, you know, Bambergers, Macy's, all of those kinds of industries began from local small collective units. And so that with selling the newspapers, the Bronner brothers doing that, the women said, okay, I've made up some hair preparation and I put it in a jar. When you go deliver the newspaper, also find out if you can sell this. And sh that's how the business started into this uh, multi-million dollar business. So we today uh, must continue this tradition and economics and pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. So let's quickly, before my time uh, gets away with me, uh, begin to look at something that was written with the women of um, around Tuskegee, the women to help build Tuskegee in Institute. And um, one woman's name was uh, Dr. They call H. T. Dillon, D. I. L. L. O. N. And um, she what became, a, 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 um, she entered upon her work as a resident physician in, at Tuskegee Institute. In addition to her oversight of the physical state of the many pupils and to the care of the sick to whom she is not only the physician, but in most cases the nurses, nurse as well. And so she formed two evening classes for the special purpose of training some of the uh, pupils to become nurses. Now it is a gratifying thing to see uh, how apt those students had become because uh, in many cases uh, she was talking about the hundreds of students that started to come and she was able to teach them in reference to nursing and other uh, kinds of professions at that time. And in the process she was able to raise uh, well, in the beginning, $400, uh, but also much needed funds, $250,000, just for the room and board of some of the students at Tuskegee uh, uh, Institute. Uh, there's also descriptions of her finding the condition of the black students and black people at that time, and thus the sociological, Dr. Said, need for uh, uplifting the people. Take the life of the average girl, quote. In this home, they huddled at night in sleeping rooms, the degradation uh, with fathers, brothers, and often hired hand. Day by day, these girls worked beside men in the field, often untidy and often indecently dressed. Um, all this through the week, Saturday, they came streaming to the town to stand above uh, on the streets and uh, to beg for money and, and stand there and dipping snuff, okay, and to beg for treats and to gossip and listen to and pass jokes that were uh, insults to any girl or woman in whom there is a spark of womanly modesty. Overall, this is thrown an atmosphere of um, uh, in other words, moral degradation. She describes all of the detail that, that's, that's just, just so terrible. And uh, so what do they do in response to this? They begin to set up these school houses uh, where the young girls can be taught homemaking, how to make friends, to be interested in um, 
other people and to help other people even before yourself and then you would be taken care of. The atmosphere of the place was uh, immoral. They taught them how to create atmospheres uh, that were uh, uh, healthy and of a virtuous woman. And so this idea of Adelaide Sanford talks about sending the young girls to finishing schools and so that they would learn to wear the white collar and to wear the whole full bodice tailored clothing that they could tailor themselves to learn to sew and to learn how to present yourself to other people and to the world. And so socializing them into the virtues became very, very important to the fact that when I came up, this is what was done. We were cultivated. You didn't just walk in any old way or slouch around with drawers hanging, et cetera, et cetera. There was a way to go approach the business uh, world, to approach uh, if you want to progress and move up. And these were the things that these women became experts in, in doing. At Tuskegee, when I went down there as part of a team of people from Washington, D.C., to peruse uh, and uh, codify some of the holdings, they had had instruments and furniture from, um, from Africa because Booker T. Washington did travel to Africa, to South, teaching how to grow cotton, and then also to East Africa. And so some of those holdings, those African chairs, and then we saw certain different kinds of, you know, the scoop out tight with the little uh, legs at the bottom, wooden legs, but a scoop out for the whole body and it leans back. That's the African style, one of them. And the students learned to make those African styles and to uh, go into making furniture as well as, of course, animal husbandry that Leonard and I, when we were down in Tuskegee, uh, we learned those things. And the information about the women are even collected from one of the books that uh, I bought down there at that time, which taught, I put it in the plastic because it's coming apart. Uh, the Economic Power, the Original Plan of Booker T. Washington. And it's showing you all of the economic uh, development and the industries that they started to begin and those are related to Africa. And so that when we talk about the um, uh, many hundreds of organizations that develop for self-help, uh, one good book is called The Collective Courage, A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. And the author is a woman whose name is Jessica Jordan, um, Nimhart, N-E-M-B-H-A-R-D. And that book is uh, this one. And so you can learn about how we work to create our own banks, our own insurance companies, and could work together. So forget about blacks don't work together, steal the money, go off, and, and things don't work. Forget about it. This book tells you the contrary, naming the names of the institutions and the places. And so let me just kind of like cite a few so you can get an understanding that in 1780, you had the establishment of the uh, African Mutual Aid Society in Rhode Island. And it was done by the African Methodist Church. 1787, the Free African Society is founded in Philadelphia by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. 1790, Women's Mutual and Society's Proliferation. 1825, the Nashoba Commune is founded by Francis Wright for blacks in Tennessee. Okay, 1830, the Negro Convention Improvement in Philadelphia, Negro Convention Movement, I'm sorry, in Philadelphia is an important stimulus to the growth of beneficial societies across the nation. Um, uh, forgive me from looking down, reading some of the research stuff, but you are researchers, and uh, I really want you to get the data. I could easily just put this down and go off talking and expounding, but I want you to have the data so that if you're able to get the tape or listen to the tape again, uh, you'll know what books to research and to pick up on. Okay, 1831, the Wilberforce Colony in Ontario, 
uh, Canada. Uh, that was a black self-sustaining commune owning livestock, land, and a school. And uh, then you have 1842, I'm just skipping to some of them. The Northampton Association of Education and Industry, founded in Northampton, Massachusetts, is the intentional, racially integrated community base around a community that owned a silk mill. Okay, then you had the Combahi River Colony, a collective in the South Carolina and the Sea Islands, and we remember what Tunis Campbell did, right? After, uh, um, during Reconstruction. Um, that was the foundation when he really wanted a whole state. He wanted a whole state, which reminds us of the Nation of Islam that also wanted a whole state under Elijah Mo um, uh, Mo Mohammed, right? Uh, but the Nation of Islam even owned land and did the same thing. That's why they love Booker T. Washington. So all of this back to Africa that he did, uh, Booker T. going to Africa and coming back, these continued, uh, were continued thoughts. And then you had the Independent Order of St. Luke, an African-American woman's sickness and death mutual benefit association. And that was established by, um, in Maryland by Maggie, uh, uh, Lena Walker, Maggie Lena Walker. And um, so on and on, uh, I won't go through any more, but you know that there were banks, insurance companies, and all kinds of little uh, groups that wanted to make men and women uh, into these uh, individuals that could wear shirts and ties and vests and part of the navigating of the regular uh, country. But then there became Ella Joe Baker uh, and George Schuyler established the Young Negroes of Cooperative Leagues. And Baker is the first secretary treasurer and is chair of the New York Council. And then eventually you have uh, um, Helena Wilson is elected the first president of the college of the, Ch of the Chicago ch chapter of the HBCPs the Ladies Auxiliary in October and serves until 1953. Okay, um, so uh, you have the Negro Women's Cooperative, um, and uh, these led into the organizations that Amy Garvey and uh, Amy Jack also promoted and even went to Africa with and learned to develop things in Africa, okay? So uh, let's take a look now with quickly at Mary McLeod Bethune because she is the one that uh, was a child of former slaves and uh, was in uh, Daytona uh, in Florida where she developed a normal and industrial institute and that eventually became the Bethune-Cookman College as it grew and grew because she's the one that started off with like five students and she insisted during that slaving era to learn and she was in a large family but she left and walked five miles to go to school. Can you imagine? Because the rest didn't learn to read and write. So after Reconstruction, during that period, about 90% learned to read and write quick and fast, quick and fast. So these schools that can't teach the kids uh, to read and write, something is wrong. And so 90%, and so she was one, she walked five miles to be taught and to learn how to read, and she came back, taught her family, and other people that were around her family until eventually she was the one to develop these, uh, the, the, the Bethune-Cookman College uh, with that effort. Um, so that's an aspect that's not always talked about. What you hear about her is um, her involvement with the president, uh, Calvin Cooldridge. Uh, that invited her to participate in a conference on child welfare. And uh, President Herbert Hoover, she served on the commission and house, home building, and home ownership and was appointed to a uh, committee on child health 
but she's most known with her work that she did with President Frank Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and then from that, as she worked with those presidents, then on her own, she worked with civil rights organizations like the National Council for Negro Women and, um, and also the National Youth Administration and for Negro Affairs, those kinds of things with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And so now let's move to Amy Ashwood um, to get a little thought here. Amy Ashwood was the first wife of Marcus Garvey. And um, and the, the book about her is the one that Leonard had in his library. And uh, this is the book. And it's called The Biography uh, of Amy Ashwood Garvey, co-founder uh, of the UNIA. That's this book. And the author is uh, Lionel Yard, Y-A-R-D. And uh, in this book, he is the one that begins to and also on some of the clips that I listened to, historical uh, voices of her, she is the one that pushed Marcus Garvey uh, into becoming even the more charismatic and dramatic. And the hymn that she uh, sung on the old tapes that I listened to, it says, processional hymn, sound the chariot uh, church trumpet. Uh, in Africa, a boundless land, all oh, sons and daughters. This is, you know, part of the words of the song. Africa shall be free, land and tropical splendor, the skies of blue, land of light, prophet. Um, and then she goes on to talk about the, uh, the, 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 the courage and of him, and so he became quite grandiose, and so that's why you see him with the uniform on after being an earl or duke, you know, great titles of landlords and uh, rising up, and the great plume on top of the head, you know, uh, as you saw when you saw African chiefs coming out, you know, they would often not just come out just ordinary, but they're coming to as a panoply to presentation of their gold and their emblems and their signs and their shields uh, of power and authority. And so he was copying that power format, that power authority, and from the excitement that he got from this wife, this early wife, that um, he was attracted to her in 1940. Uh, 14 because of her ability to speak. So she would get up with this kind of, um, of pump and circumstance herself and that is what she kind of like fostered on uh, to him. But once again, in two or three months, the marriage didn't quite last and she had to kind of like pull back to retreat to get her own forces. And this is what happens sometimes. People marry people like that and they become burnt out because they don't consider themselves like they ought to, et cetera. They don't get the vacations, perhaps. Uh, there's many things that we would need to continue to study about uh, her life. And so uh, she helped him to get where he was. Now, she was a darker woman, and she also, after she left him, continued to thrust for Africa because it was in her veins. The blood of Ghana was in her veins, and she traced her entire heritage back to Ghana uh, through her grandparents uh, that had the information, you know, like the Roots story. She, so she was able, not like Roots, to get into a very uh, theatrical, dramatic things, but she was very pinpointed and found the actual town, Juaben, J-U-A-B-E-N, that area and the clan that she uh, belonged to. And so she became an integral part of Ghana. Uh, she was installed and she wore the, you know, the, the kenti and she, um, uh, you know, was, was very powerful. She too did the work with young women and young men 
and uh, eventually had a restaurant and people would come uh, uh, to discuss the information of the day and the time. And chances are that's when they were discussing the interlocking directories of the wealthy and the role and what the Ku Klux Klan was doing and what can we do. Uh, she knew all about the uh, conference in Berlin where they had divided up Africa, uh, the Europeans amongst themselves for Africa for the copper and for the tin and for the gold and the agricultural exploitations. Um, so Amy was a part of all of that and also the union. She was interested in the labor unions. And so she, in London, had a house that was on one Bassett Road. And uh, that became a community place for uh, people to uh, have counsel and well, a welfare center. It became a welfare center. And once again, the catering business for food and also laundry. And it was organized women, how to organize women for economic uh, advancement. And the restaurant where people, all of the dignitaries and high-powered people would come to discuss the affairs of the day, that was at 62 Oxford Street uh, and became a, both a nightclub and a restaurant. And so back as time moved on with her Ghanaian connections in 1970, um, I was at the funeral of Prempe II uh, in Ghana because I mentioned I went there um, and that was very, very important so that I had a relationship with the same people that she did. And so I too was installed and given names. One of the names, Esiebedio, uh, is one that they gave me. Another place, Iyamide, amongst the Europa. And that name means grandmother has returned. And I didn't like the name back then because I said, well, I don't, I'm not a grandmother, I wasn't as old as I am now. But the name was perfect because I started to deal with the antiquities and to deal with history and these kinds of things. Now, very briefly, I would like for you to know about uh, the other Amy. Uh, the other Amy, Jax, was the second wife. And she was the one to support him when he was uh, uh, cast into prison. And it was on what? Male charge. And so I said, well, what is this male charge? The male charge had to do with soliciting money for the UNIA through the mail, right? And so what do we do today? You go home and you open up your mail. Half the mail is advertisements. Half the mail is soliciting for funds. So he, he, Garvey went to get to jail for something we commonly do today. They even send you a credit card in the mail. Right? And so that we must ask, why did they put Chalk James into the prison, who had built housing projects here, and go and look and see what the real truth behind things are, and not just take uh, everything you read in the newspaper for gospel truth. But I just want to say that this woman was a different woman. She came from the elite class and uh, that high brow, and so Garvey didn't know whether he could relate to her but so well. She was the secretary of the first wife, and she helped to get things together. And so here it is, the secretary ends up marrying the husband of uh, her boss, and that's what happened. But meanwhile, of course, uh, the first wife had left. And so the second one wrote his memoirs, and put all of the stuff together, like the second wife of John Henry Clark, that gathers his material and stuff and puts it down in Clark uh, Atlanta when other people want to take it and use it for the wrong reasons. And so this is why we say his memoirs. And she wrote uh, for the um, newspaper, uh, the, the Negro World, and uh, the, the, the Journal. And so she became a powerful force to move in uh, and do these things. And she gave birth to two children, which were the Garvey, Julius Garvey, Dr. Julius Garvey, and also Dr. Marcus Garvey, who lived very close to us. So my life and Leonard's life is intricately woven in behind the things that Du Bois did with the establishing the Du Bois Center in Ghana and also with Nkrumah and intricately woven in with the lives of these people at this particular day and time. 
And uh, with that, because I'm uh, beginning to wind down and to conclude, I would want to say to you that Shirley Graham, 1896 to 1977, she played a very uh, helpful role in relationship to um, Du Bois, right? And um, uh, uh, the president of Monrovia College, Monrovia, Liberia in 1926. Uh, her father was a part of that. Her father was a minister. And uh, she ended up teaching fine arts at Tennessee and taught music uh, and took classes at Yale University and at NYU and got her doctorate in English in NYU. So she was well equipped to do the work that had to be done at that particular uh, day, age, and times, and was involved with Freedom Ways magazine, which was the voice for the many. Uh, now, I'm uh, going to end just saying to you that there's so much, and I like, hate to be on the paper on the paper in a lecture when I'm noted for being all around, but I wanted to end with Mo Queen Mother Moore, uh, who, uh, uh, Audley E. Moore, and she was considered a warrior woman that talked about reparation. Leonard and I was at the 1973 Gary Indiana Conference, and she was there talking about uh, reparations. She used to say rap, reparations, reparations. But she was very, very uh, special. She is the President General of the World Federation of African People. And she was the founder and president of the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women. She is a life member of both the universe, the UNIA, and also the Moorish Council of Negro Women, and played a bishop role. She has a bishop of the Apostolic Orthodox Church of Judea, which was part of Marcus Garvey's uh, Ethiopian Church. But we realized that those that laid the foundation for these things were those women that were supporting women. Even Martin Luther King, remember, it was the women that got the movement together and wanted him to come in as their leader. So I say unto you uh, in the very last words, keep us forever in the path we pray, lest our feet stray from the place where God, where we met thee. Least our heart, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. And I'd like for you to repeat after me, true to our God, true to our native land. True to our God, true to our native land. Thank you. Y'all can do better than that. Let's give a round of applause to Mama Roger, Dr. Roger, <laughs> Rosalind Jeffries. Yes, indeed. And before she leaves, I'm going to have her and Dr. J come up to the, uh, to the, to the, to the podium for a moment. Uh, we won't leave them without a little token of our appreciation here. Uh, we have a little, since it's, you know, it's, it's their anniversary, we want to make sure that both of them leave with a little something here. So we got a, a, just a little, a couple things, some ECC scarves and cups and stuff for them. So we want to give them something like one for each of them to take with them. Uh, and, um, and so um, I want to make sure that we also, uh, before we get out of here, I want to thank us to thank again uh, Dr. Professor uh, Arzalia Saeed. Let's give her another round of applause. And uh, thank her for uh, helping to co-sponsor this uh, wonderful event. No problem. Thank you. Okay.